let's continue to raise the spirit with our next song, Put Your Hand in the Hand. Energized? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's sing our next song, Filled with Your Glory.
we've really uh, lifted our voices onto our Heavenly Father this morning, and I'm sure he's feeling glorified. Um, so now please join me in reciting our family pledge, number five. Our family, the owner of Channel Gook, pledges to strive every day to advance the unification of the spirit world and physical world as subject and object partners by centering in true love. Please join me in prayer. Our dearest, most beloved Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we could all be gathered here this morning as brothers and sisters. Um, so we have a few announcements this morning. Um, uh, first of all, if I can ask Pastor Hayashi to come up and give an announcement. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, one, I mean, two things. Uh, one, uh, first one is that uh, uh, we want to do raffle tickets after the service. The purpose of the raffle ticket is uh, to support one family. Uh, one family needs urgently, you know, the uh, raise money, 500 pound, and uh, we want to sell raffle ticket. So after the service, I have a ticket, she has a ticket. This is the price of the raffle ticket. If you are lucky, you can have this wonderful marble vase. Uh, so please uh, buy um, the one ticket for uh, adult and family, five pounds, and for second generation, two pounds each. Okay, so please uh, uh, support that. And uh, uh, second thing is that um, uh, demonim is coming soon, and uh, um, there are two events, in, one in Germany, one in Hungary. So if you would like to go, <coughs> please talk to me. Uh, the thing is uh, not simple and easy. Uh, there's a paperwork, there's money involved. So please uh, uh, talk to me after the service. And tonight I'm having a birthday party. You're all invited. <laughs> Probably won't all fit in, but there's plenty of overflow space because we'll be outside anyway. The address is 76 Dudland Road, Hanwell W7. You can get to Ealing Broadway and get the bus or walk. It's the E1 opposite the Broadway station. Get off at Hall Drive and walk down the road. See you there. Okay, um, another announcement. Uh, as you may have read from the pastor's update, uh, our dear brother Victor Lim has ascended to the spirit world on Sunday. Um, so there will be a Songhua ceremony uh, on Tuesday, the 18th, at Livingston House in Chislehurst. Um, and it starts at 10.30 a.m. Um, and then the Wandron will be... Uh, at the Holyoke Memorial Woodland at 3.30.
So if you can make it to support the Lim family, I'm sure they'll be very grateful. Um, and then also, I've got another announcement. Uh, so there's going to be a straight talk on Sunday, the 23rd of October for, uh, with Uncle David and Auntie Mary uh, for second generation only, 18 years and over, both single and couples. All questions will be answered, all topics discussed, testimonies and personal talks. Sorry, no first gen invited. <laughs> um, and then there was one more announcement from Auntie Anne. Uh, anybody, especially second gen, um, it's a job available in Swiss Cottage uh, at a small art shop selling art material. And they would like somebody uh, working only Saturdays because they get too much work for the, who, who they have locally. Uh, only Saturdays and uh, all day, of course, uh, to help sell a sale assistant. I don't know how much it is. It's... Uh, Opposite Waitrose in Swiss Cottage, but further west, I think. Uh, opposite, um, um, you get, one side you get Swiss Cottage, then you get Waitrose, and a bit further you get that small shop on the other side of the road. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the phone number with me. I forgot it, but um, yes. yeah. Uh, so this is uh, there's a while they have been asking for somebody to work for them. So. And they would like somebody, preferably having uh, art uh, material uh, and uh, art uh, study or art whatever uh, uh, formation. <laughs> okay, and just very quickly a reminder about the Children's Day Pledge Service, which is on Thursday the 27th at 7 a.m. And um, the Children's Day Celebration on Friday the 28th at 6.30 p.m. And also there will be a two-day Divine Principle workshop at Livingston House from Friday the 28th to the 30th of October. Okay, so um, shortly we'll be receiving our sermon from our pastor this morning, um, Who is Your Heart For? Uh, but before that, we're going to receive one more song from the music ministry. So please feel free to join in. Defender of this heart, you loved me from the start, you never changed. Forever you 
Developing. Anyone figure out what colour it was? Red. Yeah. George has even got a little mascot there. I don't know if you can see that. You see that? It's a little monkey with a little red jumper. So, anyway, they're trying to invest and find ways to express their love to you, I guess. And so we've been looking, this is the fifth week. I know in the email I sent, I said it's the fourth. It's not. It's the fifth week now we're looking at trying to understand the human heart. And frankly, or to be candid, often it's really quite a mystery for us, isn't it? What someone's heart is. Especially even our own heart often is a complete mystery for us to really figure it out. And one of the things we need to do, therefore, I I believe, to work out what's going on in the human heart is that we need to have a clear context in which to look at it. And so we've been doing that over these weeks. And of course, the last two weeks, we've been looking at some, you could say, quite heavy topics. We looked at, the week before last, we looked at anger. What, how do you solve the problem of an angry heart? And last week, we looked at guilt. How do you solve the problem of a guilty heart and the whole restorative process of being able to confess to someone and to heal the relationship in that way and then go into a new phase in our heart from that and how, and how that frees up our heart. And so I guess probably this is going to be the last week looking at this whole area and I was trying to think what is the thing to finish up with and could have gone on to jealousy or a whole range of other heart problems. But I thought it would be good to look at something that's potentially 
really quite uplifting and also, I think, very informative for us to understand how our heart is trying to work. And I want us to look at this whole aspect of how our heart is designed for relationship. Because understanding that our heart is designed for relationship helps to explain a lot of things that we're really trying to do or we're trying to create with our heart. But again, that whole topic is still, unless put in a context where you and I can relate to in our actual life, it's, it's, it remains very theoretical. It remains... We have so much theology in our, in our faith, different faith cultures, in our different faith cu- cultures. As unificationists, we have so much theology about love and, and, and God and heart. And, and our struggle and our challenge is always to bring it into what's going on in my life. What's going on in your life? How does it relate to maybe sometimes the painful reality of your life or the, or the challenging realities of your life. And, and so as we've been looking at these topics, we've been kind of looking at, well, how do I rewire my heart so that I don't get angry? How do I fix those broken parts that have come about because of the guilt I felt about something? And... and um, um, yeah, so going on to relationship then, I want to just share something just to give you a context for relationship. Because when we read Reverend Moon, uh, True Father's words, he's able always to say so much about everything. And sometimes in a very, to, to me often, it gets incredibly complex. And I don't understand half of it. But then when I read the story that he tells about his life, I see that actually it's all based on very real human experiences. And so this is him describing how he first experienced peace. And it was through a relationship with the heart. I would often fall asleep in the hills after playing there. My father would be forced to come and find me. When I heard my father shouting in the distance, Yong Myung, Yong Myung, I couldn't help but smile even as I slept. My name as a child was Yong Myung. The sound of his voice would awaken me, but I would pretend to still sleep. He would hoist me onto his back and carry me home. That feeling I had as he carried me down the hill, feeling completely secure and able to let my heart be completely at ease, that was peace. That is how I first learned about peace while being carried on my father's back. So, you know, father can get into some really incredible cosmic explanations about God and us and God's providence that actually very insightful for the world's problems. But when you read that little paragraph and you see how just as a, a young boy and the ability to remember an experience like that and then keep that experience of that relationship, that very physical relationship that small children have when they are held by their parents. And, and to put that into his whole vision for his life and his vision for our movement and, um, is, is an incredible awareness. And... Um, he goes on to talk about other experiences of warmth of heart where the, 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 what we used to call tramps, people who just tend to walk the country up and down and don't have somewhere to live, used to stay in a barn near his house and they, they were pretty smelly and ragged but he said that there was something about their heart that wasn't ragged, it was full of love. And so he would like to go and sit out there with them and, and listen to their stories that they had from traipsing up and down North and South Korea, up and down the country. And, and, um, and so I guess you know, we can all dress very smartly and look very smart, but um, the, the question is, can we have that kind of warmth of heart that these tramps had? 
can we have the kind of relationships that they had, even though they had maybe much less than we have materially. Um, so, of course, as unifications, we, in our family pledge and in our theology, we understand that we, we learn about relationships through the family, through growing up. We talk about the four great realms of heart. Actually, in these five weeks, I haven't actually gone into all of that because I felt that's something maybe we've heard often many times, and it's just nice to hear things in a different perspective sometimes. And, of course, there we learn that there's the realm of a ch- child's heart, brother, or sister, brother and sister's heart, the heart of a husband and wife together, and finally the, the love that p- parents have towards their children, and that all these loves coalesce and come together. And... Of course, the other thing we, we learn is that how our heart is essentially God's hope was for us to, very simply speaking, have a relationship with him. And then, based on that, have a relationship with people and then create a relationship with the universe around us. And that they, these were the three purposes that God created us to experience. Um, and then, of course, after the family, you know, you probably all know what it's like and still remember what it's like going to school and creating relationships there and finding your way around the school and finding your way around the whole dynamic of the people in your class, the people who are your friends and the, the people who maybe find it harder to get on with. I was talking to my youngest son the other night, and I started this thing now when they go to bed. Uh, before we say a goodnight prayer, I say, how's your heart? Or did anyone hurt your feelings today? Because I want them to learn to live their life from their heart. And through asking them that question, I'm hoping that they might start to think like that as well. That it will create a little neural pathway for them to think, well, how's my heart right now? And, and he was saying, I said, what did you do at break time? He said, well, so-and-so wasn't my friend yesterday, and he wasn't my friend in break time, but he was my friend after break time. I said, oh, so who did you play with at break time? Well, Akshay, that's AJ son, was doing skipping, and I'm crap at that. Uh, so I didn't do that. And my other two friends didn't want to play, and Dominic was on the wall, meaning that he was got in trouble and had to stand on the wall. So I said, well, so the conclusion was he didn't have anyone to play with that break time. Um, but, you know, in your school, there's this whole thing of, I'm your friend, no, I'm not your friend now, I'm his friend now, and all of that kind of thing. And you kind of learn this whole quite difficult thing about relationships, right? Of course, we then think, or we hopefully get more mature, and then we learn to be maybe more, in some ways, more sophisticated about it, Right? And friendships last longer than a break time, hopefully. And, uh, and then, of course, maybe you get married and maybe you have a family and, and then you don't have any time for social life anymore. You just find you're at home all the time. You don't have time to go out. And um, you're kind of focusing on that whole relationship maybe in the family uh, but the whole aspect of relating socially to other people beyond your family, maybe you get a bit rusty with because you're spend, spending time sort of on family matters. Um, and then you go back to school. <laughs> you go back to school when you take your kids when they get old enough to go to school. And uh, you go through that whole experience again of making relationships in the playground but you've had that whole period of getting rusty at it uh, because of all the reasons I just explained. And you have to sort of remember again a little bit what it's like making friends at school and uh, talking to parents of other children. And um, it's uh, somehow part of what's going on, I think, is that you're remembering a little bit subconsciously, deep down, all the things you were good at doing in terms of relationships when you're at school, and all the things that you were afraid of doing as well, maybe talking to people 
And uh, I just realized that maybe it's normal for most people. I'm terrible at remembering everyone's name or where they live. And they're telling me, oh, yeah, my, the, their name, and they're saying we live over there. And I come back the next day, and I'm like, oh, gosh. I've got a li little list on my phone, at least, for my neighbors. I sort of realized how bad I am at this, and I put all their neighbors in a little note document on my phone. So that kind of getting there now, I don't need it as much. But it's just, I was wondering, why do I do that? Because you, someone tells me their name, 30 seconds later, I've forgotten it. So now I say, I, I said to someone yesterday, because we invited some parents over to our house for, because one of our boys had a birthday, and we thought it's a good chance to invite the parents over and get to know them, put this big bouncy castle up in the garden. And I was saying to one parent, uh, one parent what's, yeah, tell me your name, um, or what's your name, uh, but I'll probably forget it in 30 seconds, uh, because uh, somehow this thing... And I was wondering, why do I do that? Why do we forget people's name? Anyone else do that? Yeah? I, I mean... I think it's partly because I'm nervous. If I was really at ease, I think my memory would work better. So what am I nervous about? What am I uh, um, thinking that's going to go wrong? And, and so this whole thing about relationships. Um, then, of course, there's people we like who are, we tend to see as our friends, right? But then... What's the difference between having a friend that you like and loving people? Is there a difference? What would you like to aim for in your life? Having people that you like or having people that you love? And actually, if you ever heard any of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches about the whole time when he was dealing with all the unrest in America and the civil rights movement, he spoke about the whole issue of the people that him and his movement were confronting, all these uh, basically racist people, about how they need to love them. That you may like somebody, but um, loving your enemy or loving people... You don't have to like somebody to love them, actually. You don't have to like them at all to love them, because... The whole concept of love in the Christian tradition, the agape concept of love, is that it's an unconditional love. It's a love greater than just a human being on, a, on their own. It's something that God is involved in. That kind of love that we want to have in our life. With not just our enemies, because you need it for your enemies or the people you don't like, but we want to have that kind of love with our spouse, our, our parents, our brothers and sisters, our children. So we talk in the Unification Church of that God created in order to have a relationship, actually. So that's why our heart is designed for relationship, because God created us so that he could have a relationship. And it's you and I that, through our relationships, create our lives. So God created for a relationship, and you and me, we are, through our relationships, creating our life. They are the things, our relationships, in a sense, help to describe our life. God's life is described through the story of his relationship with his children, since he created the first human ancestors, and all the hope that he had, and how that hope was destroyed, and how that relationship was broken, and yet he continued to look at how to mend, to fix that relationship. And so if there's anything that we understand as unificationists about God's story, is that why are we here? Because we want to fix something in this world. We want to fix our lives, the things that don't work in our lives. We want to fix the things that help other people to fix the things that don't work in their lives. And in the relationships we have, we want to help fix things. And, and we have, of course, a whole teaching about how that restoration works. And so, relationships, of course, are not simple. You're, the person that you're relating to, the person you're in a relationship, maybe doesn't think like you, doesn't 
have the same interests you have, that uh, uh, different opinions, different ways of doing things. And so it's not always easy to find the way to love people, right? I just want to show you a little clip if we got it. Do we have it? It's like this clip from the, one of my favorite movies, because this movie is all about relationships. And it's about a guy who's basically quite narcissistic, and I'll talk a bit about narcissism later. And uh, he, he turns into a different kind of person by the end of the movie, because he changes all his relationships. And this little scene is called, Help Me! Help you. And uh, just to set the scene, he's a, he's a sports agent in America, and he's, he's kind of had this turmoil in his life where he seems like he's losing everything, actually. And as an agent, he, of course, had many clients, but because he got sacked um, all of a sudden, he lost all of his clients, and he tried to hold on to them. And in the end... There's this crazy scene where he's calling them all up and he's offering them better deals than other people and he's trying to convince them of how he's going to take care of them. But they all want to stay with the company that's just let him go. And he keeps one client. And this person he keeps, actually, the guy won an Oscar for the performance. Um, and he's like the most difficult, impossible client you would want to have. And... Uh, Unless he's successful with this one person, then he's got nothing. So his whole career, his whole business as an agent is based on this relationship being successful. And so anyway, this is just a little vignette or whatever you want to call it, a moment in time in a relationship. And uh, maybe you relate to with your wife or your husband or your children or your parents, having the same kind of frustration. Okay, Should we, do we need the lights off at the back? Or, yeah. okay, that sort of Odeon experience. I am out here for you. You don't know what it's like to be me out here for you. It is an up at dawn, pride swallowing siege that I will never fully tell you about, okay? In a sense, really what he's going through is he's experiencing all the motivations that he has in his work somehow getting sorted out. Because the problem you and I have with a lot of our relationships is we have mixed motives. And what Tom Cruise is experiencing there, Jerry Maguire, is that as he goes through this relationship with this, this client, Rod, who's this football player, is that he has to really start to care about him more than just in terms of the money he's going to produce for him as an agent. Yeah. And, and of course, through all of that, he starts to reflect on himself. And the question, really, I think many of us could ask when we look at, into our heart, and it's remembering that the purpose of it is essentially for the sake of our relationships in our life is that would you want to have a relationship with you? If you think about a particular relationship that you have with someone else, would you like to have that relationship with you if you put yourself in the other person's shoes? So, 
So the other complication in the whole reality of our heart being designed for relationships is that the relationships, the type of relationships God ultimately created us to have, us to have are relationships of love, which are meant to be based on free will. So, I don't know, anyone seen Bruce Almighty? I'm going to do a bit of a movie fest today. Yeah? With what's his name, the main actor? That was a bit of a mumble. Jim Carrey, Jim Carrey yeah. He's like the only time I've ever been able to go and see a movie with my wife is a Jim Carrey movie. She's like, he's like her hero. Because um, she only likes comedies. She doesn't like any action, like a lot of... Um, anyway. And, uh, uh, and she doesn't like romantic comedies, which actually I quite like. Um, and so anyway, went to see a couple of Jim Carrey movies. And there's this scene, because he's been given divine powers by God, as God wants to give you and I, right? And there's this scene where he's taken these powers and he's really messed up with them, as you and I do sometimes. And he's lost his girlfriend. And he's sort of suddenly starting to realize how good she was. And he says, how do you make somebody love you without affecting their free will? He says to Morgan Freeman, who's God. And... Morgan says back, God says back to him, Welcome to my world, son. You come up with the answer to that, come and tell me about it. Because that has been God's reality throughout history with humanity. The whole... Because we talk about God as being this all-loving, all-embracing God who can love infinitely. But of course, that doesn't mean anything until you put it into the context of God's story, of God's relationship with mankind. And then you get this whole, like I said earlier, incredible story of how God is trying to find that love relationship with his children as you go through the, all of the different stories in the Old Testament. People learning to love in a way different from the way their fallen heart. Their, their messed up heart likes to love. And so, whenever we are struggling in a, 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 a love relationship with somebody, then we can try to remember that little truth that for God also, it's a headache. Because he wants to have this relationship with you and me, but he can't make it happen it has to be mutual. It has to be based on our free will. And so I don't know if I mentioned in Sunday service, I mentioned to someone not so long ago, I went to see Deathly Hallows 2 with my eldest son because the others, I don't think they're old enough. And uh, we went to, it's a bit late in the day because, you know, it's October. It came out, God knows when. And so we saw it in the Odeon, Leicester Square, in the tiny little, like, you and your sitting room screen. And... Um, and anyway, he'd been wanting to see it for a long time, and you know, I wasn't feeling good about taking him, and I was thinking we're going to have this great conversations on the tube and, and coming back, talk about the movie, and I couldn't, it's like getting blood out of a stone, you know? It's like, we talk, I was talking about the movie, I was saying, he's really brave, isn't he? Yeah, but Dad, it's just a movie. <laughs> like... Where do you go from there? Like, I know it's a movie. But, it, but it's, it's, again, it's like, when I, once I got home, I kind of reflected and I realized, maybe we didn't need to have a conversation. You know? it's just sit on the tube together and just be. Yeah. So, so, just going back now to this movie, Jerry Maguire. That's, well, that's three movies now, yeah. Um, this is going back to the first one, is that essentially he's a very narcissistic kind of person, meaning someone who loves himself, where his life is all about him. And he starts to realize this at his party before his... Once he's got engaged, he's going to get married. And someone's made a video for him of all the girlfriends he's ever had. And they've gone round and filmed them. And they all sent a little message. It's 
a great way to get ready for your marriage. And, uh, and, and just, of course, what comes out of there is some truth about him. And he's watching it, and he starts to feel quite uneasy. They're all saying something very similar, like somehow they couldn't get under his skin. They couldn't really get close to him. They couldn't... He was a kind of person, and you and I, we're sometimes like this, that we don't want to let people in. Yeah. So we have lots of relationships, but we don't really want to let even the closest people into our heart. And of course, there's a lot of good reasons maybe why, but he... He um, has to go, like I said, through this experience of restoration of heart. And the whole thing about our heart being designed for relationship, and it's meant to be this vessel that holds the love with which we express to other people, uh, the kind of, you know, how we relate to people with the love in our heart, is that um, the whole thing about love is that love needs two, Right? Normally, you, c- and you can't love unless you have somebody or something to love. Even if you're a narcissistic person who is basically deeply in love with yourself, anyone like that sometimes? Yeah? You still, in a sense, there's still two there, isn't there? There's you. And, you're, and then there's that image you have of yourself that you're in love with. In a sense, in that narcissistic love relationship... There's still two people. There's you and that made-up you that you're in love with. And and I went out... uh, I don't know, we can all realise something of our narcissism, and we all have it to different degrees. And, of course, to be healthily uh, liking yourself uh, is not a bad thing. You've got to love yourself in some way to be a healthy person. But I think often the fact that you and I can get very self-conscious in some circumstances is a sign of maybe a little bit of narcissism somewhere inside us. I went out with uh, my my sister Aniko last week, uh, who's definitely not narcissistic, Um, and uh, we we went out around our neighbourhood sticking up the posters for our children's day. And uh, something, I don't know, for me about going out and meeting new people... Uh, and, and asking, inviting them to something, is I, I start to get a little bit self-conscious. And I'm like, Annika, I'll stay here with the buggy, with uh, Akshay, with, uh, with Bobby and Hanul. You go in. I'll just make sure they're okay here. And, um, and the interesting thing about Annika is that she, for her, she, she really wasn't self-conscious at all about where to go. Whether it was the after-school club place or the community centre where me and the boys and her boys go boxing or or the swimming pool. I thought, well, you can't put it up in the swimming pool. It's not a community centre type place. Or is it? And, you know, she went in there. Again, I sort of did that sort of backward step thing. Yeah? Backward step. (laughs) And and, and she was just very patiently waiting and, and, you know, there was... As she asked, there was not any sense of self-consciousness as she asked. And, you know, as I was reflecting about that and we were talking about, you know, family life on the way and showing about, you know, different trials and tribulations of family life. And um, so, you know, not, she's not got a perfect life in any sense. But there was this humility there. So I thought, wow, I could do a bit of that. I could do with a bit of that. Uh, in my relationships. And, of course, that heart God created for you and I is something that needs humility in order to be able to truly love. And that's something I'd like to show you in this next little video uh, with Jerry Maguire. So, not only did he have to develop this relationship with Rod, the football player, he had another relationship, which was with a secretary uh, from the company, uh, as he's walking out of the company, he makes this big speech and says, is anyone coming with me? And everyone turns the other way. And the secretary, who's, what's she called again, the actor, actress? Renee, Renee with that funny surname that I can't say. Zellweger. Zellweger. Um, she grabs a little um, goldfish from her desk and says, I'm coming with you. 
And the start of this scene that you'll see is them going down in the lift just after they've left the office. And they're just starting out. She's going to be working for him. Uh, you, have you got the second video as well? No. Oh, brilliant. And, uh, and then the next scene that it cuts to is right at the end of the movie, where it's basically, of course, they've gone through a whole relationship thing. And um, he's realized that basically God's designed him with this heart that needs to be in a relationship with another person, not with himself. So anyway, take a look. Oh, oh. Just, um, go back to the beginning and uh, pause. Did it ruin it? No. Can you go back to the beginning. Turn around. So I was going to warn you about the kiss as well. So then, Sunday morning. Tonight, our little project, our company, had a very big night. A very, very big night. But it wasn't complete. It wasn't nearly close to being in the same vicinity as complete. Because I couldn't share it with you. I couldn't hear your voice or laugh about it with you. I miss, I miss my wife. We live in a cynical world. A cynical world. And we work in a business of tough competitors. I love you. You complete me. You might just as just shut up. You had me at hello. You had me at hello. So, <laughs> sort of laughter over here from the lads section. Um, I thought it was really moving, didn't you over here? Yeah, thank you. So. <laughs> Uh, I want to just read you something from uh, our true father. A being that can relate to God has a value that is greater than that of God himself. The value of a partner, of any being that is a counterpart to another, is so great that it cannot be exchanged for anything, anyone, even for God. So I want you just to think about for a moment about the people in your life who you are who are your counterparts the people you are in relationship with and see about whether they are more valuable to you than you are to you and whether you're able to get into some kind of way of looking at them as god looks at them and to be able to find a heart that doesn't like people or like your friends, but is able to love people. I went up to see uh, past 
I went up to an event in north of England a couple of weeks ago. I think I've mentioned this before. And on the way back, I stopped to see a friend who had been a close friend at university who I liked a lot. Uh, but ever since we all graduated, she's had multiple sclerosis. And I've only spoken on the phone a couple of times. And I finally came to the conclusion in my heart that I should stop on the way down and visit. And I did. And yeah, we had a chat, and that was it. And then I came back. Her dad drove me to York Station. And, um, and for me, that was the first step in just going from being a friend to actually loving that person. So I think one of the things also many of you want to be able to do, and I think God wants all of us to be able to do, is to be able to have a relationship of heart, of love, with people in the context of our faith. And really just to conclude then with that, how can you be able to share that thing that's most precious in your life, if it is your faith, to share that with other people in a relationship of heart. Because we have a lot of workshops and events in our movement and books to give people, and books are good, and we could do with more books. And we have this chart on the wall downstairs that I need to do a bit more promotion for that is there to help us see how we are reaching out to others as a community. And that actually in order for us to reach out successfully, have to start to really look at it in the context of a love relationship. And um, the only person I've ever, ever really successfully done that with is with one girl uh, who's a good, really good friend of mine now, lives in Ireland. Her name's Mandy. And um, she wasn't my friend when I met her. But she really is now, the kind of friend that you know, I'll keep forever and ever. Because I was able to share something that's most essential about my life, which is my relationship with God. And I think sharing our faith is the most amazing experience when we're able to do it. Because it completes God's circuit of love. That God has kind of got this... Well, you know, like an electrical circuit that needs to be completed in order for everything to flow. And it's only when we help him to complete it, to complete those relationships, like uh, Tom Cruise just experienced having that relationship completed. And uh, there's no better feeling than being part of God's creative process in completing that circuit of love. I'm always grateful to Mandy for that, because without her, I wouldn't have experienced that. I've never experienced anything quite like that before. Taking part in God's creative act of love in that way. And of course, when I did it then, I was a missionary uh, with someone who just changed their life around all of a sudden. And she was someone ready to change her life around all of a sudden very much like I did, and also she was ready to become a missionary. But I'm not a missionary anymore. Uh, I live in one place. I don't get into a fundraising van every day or whatever I used to do when I was a missionary. And so I have to learn to take what that whole experience into this new phase of my life. And for me at the moment, it's kind of the school playground. And those relationships there are very finite at the moment and limited to certain things. But, of course, what's in my heart is that I would like those relationships to be much more infinite and complete and much more profound. So, it's really having to find God in a different way or in a different environment. 
So, just you know, I'm always grateful to all of you for coming here on a Sunday because it's very much to do with our relationship as a community. Uh, but in the end, though, I really want our community to be one of people who are here because their heart wants them to be here. And once we are really here because of that reason, we can do a lot more together. It's like once your heart is really locked in to a particular relationship, it can just, you can do amazing things. Because as long as it's always hovering, as long as it's always half complete, you never really go, your heart never really gets engaged. The relationship never really goes anywhere. But once the heart is really locked into a relationship and you're able to invest everything into it, then incredible things happen. So I really pray that our community can be one that has that kind of heart towards one another. Whatever the difficulties are, you know, occasionally, sometimes, you know, sometimes we've had problems with the mini... I know Marshall's doing a great job trying to get the minibus running on a regular basis and you know sometimes someone doesn't call about the minibus or there's many other examples and situations that you know go on between us <clears throat> and um, but uh, if you're locked into that relationship of heart then you, you and I we will find incredible solutions to the problems and challenges that we face and then we can share it with others so please join me in the prayer Heavenly Father, we pray to you now and we look at the scope of our community to really fulfill your ideal of love for each of us to have a heart that's free of things that can erode or corrode it and, but have a heart that's healthy and beating and is able to invest all our energy just as you did into us, into the relationships that we have in our family, in our community, in the wider society that we live with, that we can help each relationship to go to a new stage through developing the type of love that we express to others. Heavenly Father, please bless everybody here as they go into their week ahead and help them to have a good plan for their week uh, in what they do and in how they're going to relate to others. And I pray all these things in my name, Simon Cooper, Bless Central Family. Thank you. So let's invite the band back, and we're going to have a time offering now. So let's take this chance to share with God about what's going to happen in our week and ask him what he would like to happen. And please join together with the band in singing. And if you want to offer your donation or tithing, please just come up and uh, feel free.
join me in prayer. Good afternoon, dearest beloved Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for um, this day and this opportunity to come before you and uh, join together as one community, one congregation, and more importantly, one family under you, Heavenly Father. Um, trying to live every day as best as possible and uh, try to fulfill uh, our potential um, in the way that we can become like you, Heavenly Father. Um, I pray we can reflect on the words we could receive today and um, take these words into the next week ahead and really think about what it is that we want to uh, gain and more importantly what it is we want to give um, in order to be able to be a channel for you Heavenly Father to the people that we meet every day um, in our workplace, in our school place, um, at home in the family. So thank you so much for um, all the offerings and um, uh, the blood, sweat, and tears that people uh, work for every week, and so they can offer uh, just a portion of that. Um, still, this is our offering to you, and we pray you can receive it, and pray uh, this money can be used for your will, Heavenly Father, and all of the great things to come. Thank you so much, and we want to offer this prayer on behalf of everyone here. In my name, Kathleen Loney, daughter of Bethlehem Trafalgar, our chief. Um, as you may have read in the pastor's update, we're going to have a community photo. So if you could all just stay in your seats and then we're just going to set up um, so that we can take a photo of all of you. Maybe the people right at the back, because we can't really see you there, if you can, you know, there's a few. 